Okay, my friends, this is... <laughs> I was just going to do a very brief thing about my past with Mary Schweitzer, Mark Armitage, this dinosaur horn and the loose connective tissue that they discovered years ago. Because I was in that same sort of realm. It didn't work out well with them. <laughs> they, because everybody's scared to talk to me because I'm, my claims are so incredibly exceptional, but they are 100% certified. I mean, I have more evidence than they do. I have CAT scans, I have DNA specimens, I have, all, I have the specimens, I have all of that. And I know the process, this is nucleophilic substitution. Anyway, any rate, I, it, it started off to be, I thought I was going to sort of go a certain way. Well, it turned out to be what you call a mud fossil free-for-all. <laughs> You, you cannot start into something and then just say, okay, that's it, da, 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 done, let's go on to something else. No. Everything ties into everything else. I mean, literally everything. So, if I run off to something that doesn't sound like it's connected, trust me, it will connect. Okay, let's, I'm going to cut to the chase here. They have been doing the analysis on this soft tissue that's coming from this particular dinosaur horn. And it's, it's also, once they treated it with the chemistry to get rid of all the crystals, it goes back to its collagen form, which is the rubbery stuff, which I, I think you can do it with a lot of the different mud fossils, for sure. Now, especially in connective tissue, because it's, it's a structural thing. It's like this right here. You see that? That's a lung. But all of this fabric in here, that's all that collagen. It has to go like this and like that. That's why it didn't deteriorate. The collagens are tough. Very, very, very tough. And, and the same thing with this. Is it coats the bones. It coats everything. It coats even your skin. Augustus' head here. Caesar. All right, there's his feathers. Wherever this, for some reason, it, the heat and the salty waters appears to be the reason that the collagens, and of course all the transition metals in there too, you have to have everything. You can, I tried making them with different types of things, but you need the whole entire animal because you need the bile and the you know, stomach acids and blood and all that stuff together. And then apparently it was cooked for quite a quite a time. It took seven days, they say, for the the comet to almost hit Earth, and it it just boiled the waters and cooked everything as it as it was beating down on like the sun, but on steroids. And so after the seven days, it just sort of glanced off of our atmosphere and really just basically combusted the atmosphere. And anybody that it, it would seem, I would say. To anybody that wasn't way, way, way up on a mountain inside of a cave would have been cooked. And um, I, it, I, it, was, it seems pretty obvious to me that not just Noah survived, but apparently that was the story, that he was um, sheltered from this somehow in his boat. Now, um, but like I say, Derek, Derek Briggs from Yale University signs off the fact that there was a great worldwide flood on one very specific layer and all of the perfectly preserved mud fossils are on that layer and they have no explanation for it. And that's why I have the explanations. I can tell you exactly what happened. I tell you why. And I have them right in front of me. I have them DNA tested and CAT scan. There is no more mystery. The mystery is, is that I can't get anybody to look at it from either side. Because I am, I, I'm about two or three levels above everybody else as far as, well, I'm way over the top of that as far as size goes, but I am showing what I'm showing because I'm showing what there is. I'm not showing something that isn't there. Okay, my friends, this is it. This is a trip down memory lane, and one of the first people I talked to about mud fossils was this guy right here, Gil Headley. Very, very, very accomplished guy. And this was like 14 years ago. He's given this speech about fuzz, which is fascia. And at that time, they called it fuzz. It was just something that was there to pad everything else. It cushioned everything so you could move around and everything was fine. Well, that, then, after I talked to him about this, I don't know, maybe 
a few years, a year or two after the, he put this out, because he was the only one talking about this layer of fuzz. All the other anatomists apparently thought it was just a flat layer, because in, up until 2018, they didn't realize it was, it's really called interstitching by the end. But anyway, and 10 years ago, he puts about reconsidering the fuzz. Let's talk about this again. Maybe we didn't have it right. And then he goes on and on and on here about all of this, you know, really about all your body everywhere. But fascia is the big thing. Fascia and stretching and moving and having the fluidity in your body. This guy is fabulous. Gil Headley. Anyway, so I I worked with him, and he um, he just commented. That's all. He doesn't endorse anything I say necessarily. He hasn't told me I said anything wrong either. Because I was finding all kinds of stuff inside the membrane, and that's what it is. These membranes are coating and sealing organs and everything else. And if you get inside, you find all of, all the body parts. And I mean. I found literally all of them. Here's a hair from a gigantic creature. That's a hair. And you think I'm kidding you? Well, check this out, and then let's go forward. All right, here, I got a better one than that. This one here, look. You see this? That's what they call the erector muscle, erector pili muscle. It attaches right there. Let's see your hair can do this. Go up on end. All right, there's the hair. Comes out the top. Well, what's over here? What's this? It's a sebaceous gland. <laughs> the hair grows right down from the bottom. It actually grows down and then back up. I don't know if they really know that. These are the two blood vessels, the vein and artery. This is nucleophilic substitution. This was in a certain condition, in a certain chemistry, in a certain amount of fluidity and pressure and temperature that all of the invading molecules took up residence here and replaced what was in it. It was called nucleophilic invasion and substitution. I know this stuff pretty well now. Trust me, I have a lot of years now working on this. So anyway, this is the size of the creatures we're talking about. So nobody wanted to even get to talk to me about it because, I, you know, you're insane, you're a crazy guy. No, I'm not. I'm just a, an observer of reality. So, I mean, I got blood literally coming out of rocks. That's a bone. Bones turn to stone. It's the nucleophilic substitution. This particular area in Connecticut, right near Yale, is, is <laughs> the, the, the preservation absolutely unbelievably flawless. Look at this. And giants. I got lots of giants. It's just a fact. If you didn't see this and understand what this is, as a this pili erector muscle and the sebaceous gland and the hair follicle, you know, then your mind is broken. If you can't accept what you see, your mind has the issue, not mine. All right, so now, I start trying to present this. Nobody will look at it. Absolutely to very, very nasty responses from the top people I expected to be, you know, wow, let's take a look. No, absolutely not. Do not come here with that, Roger. We will not allow you in. This is a toe, I mean, a, a fingertip. That's the bone right at the, well, a little pad that goes between the, this one and the next bone, so a rock. That's the fingernail. That thing's three feet long, and it's DNA tested. And when I broke this piece off over here to get to the blood, I found the fingernails were still on her. Uh, fingerprints are still on her. <laughs> it's got a fingernail and it's got fingerprints. See? My thumb is the same size as one of these finger ridges. Now, I've been saying this over and over and over for years. That's why I'm going through this about my history here. You see that? That's, the, that's what peels right off. Because it still won't be accepted. It's just too much for the human mind to accept. Look at this. These are hairs. Those are hairs. You see the black and the red? That means vein blood and artery blood. This is white as normally as kaolin type clays, which is skin clays. So just think if this was skin and these were hairs. Now, I, I do know something about this that I don't think this, well, I'm, I'm going to reserve my statements about what kind of a creature this was until later. But black and red is vein and artery blood. One of them has O2 in the blood and this one has the O3, extra oxygen. 
This is normally you find in finer skin. You have the white clays. Um, and I have blood just coming right out of them. These are both lungs. And this is what Gil was talking about, the fascia and the fuzz. They used to call this stuff fuzz. Well, it's, it's pleura, fascia. And now he, he gets very deep into this stuff. I just watched the one he had on um, about fascia. And um, he talks about all the different layers. Maybe I should show you some of that. I'll probably show a little of that. Uh, anyway, the blood comes out of them. The blood gets sealed inside. The red blood is fluid literally forever. That's why they make iron out of the red blood, the hematite. The magnetite is a black blood. That's the hard. That stuff gets hard. But the, the red blood just, look, it bubbled right out of there. That's, that actually bubbled out of that lung. All right, and this is a lung. It came out of these little spots here. This is that little flap that I talk about all the time that is, is the interstitial highway. And I believe that little tube runs between, like, this will have one in here, too. This just is com so complete that you can't see inside of it, like this one. But this has the latch. This has the latch. i got another one over here that has the latch on it. You see, that's the latch right there. And they're both flat. Every one of them is flat as a pancake on one side. Even my goose, Caesar, perfect on this side, flat on that side. Died like that. This is feathers. And the reason these are all protected in capsules and they just didn't wear away is because of the chemistry of the collagen. Collagen chemistry is what made these plastic bags around these organs and around the skin and the thumbs and the fingers. They fell apart. They break right up like here. They just break right off into these little lumps. But they're, um, they're wrapped inside with these little fabric bags. All your organs, your bones, your muscles, your eyeballs, everything has a, 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 a membrane, a fabric around it that only allows things into that region and things out that it wants to, if it's healthy. The membrane is the key to being healthy. That's where your immune system sits, is in that membrane. Shown that a million times, too. Now, anything can turn to anything. That's a fingertip, and that's the blood. Little, that, that's the, literally the blood. It ran out the fingertip when it congealed, and it was, it was laying in this direction like this. All these little crystals down here are the blood that has crystallized. Blood and body tissues and bo um, body um, fluids create all of the um, crystals that you see. That's where body fluids, body fluids are the source of crystals. And there's apparently 12 of them that are, are supposed to be special crystals. And they irradiate in the infrared region or ultraviolet. I guess it's ultraviolet. I can't remember now. But there's a you hit them with a certain frequency of light, and and they just glow. You know. Uh, anyway, that's crystals are nothing more than bodily fluids. And he talks about fascia and all the different layers of fascia, blood is connective tissue. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. When I heard him say that, I said, oh, come on, Gil. He said, yeah, blood's connective tissue. And uh, uh, there's a whole, well, well i got to show you this because it's hard to understand until you're on a level like Gil is. Then you can understand it. Don't forget now, this guy's a pretty top-shelf guy. This was 10 years ago at the Fascia Congress in Vancouver. And he's saying, let's reconsider the fuzz. Let's talk about it. All right, my friends. This is my mud fossil past. Soft tissue and dinosaur bones. This is a, a presentation by, is Genesis history? They want to know, is this history that they were talking about, or are they just making up things? Well, here's they're looking into soft tissue and dinosaur bones. And this is, I'm going to bring up some sore spots here um, because I go back as early as the, all of these people and uh, I think I showed you all about Gil Headley for, or, already but maybe I didn't I 
but you'll see about him, and how I understood about the fascia. The fascia was the key. Once I was off and running with the fascia, it was all over. I, was, I could understand basically all of it after that. Well, we were looking at dinosaur fossils. The, the bones have been fossilized from dinosaurs. Um, and these honestly look more like rocks to me, but they're... <laughs> what, what do you have here? What do you say? Well, studying? this actually is not a bone. These are fragments of a triceratops horn. Okay. Uh, in 2012, the Creation Research Society sponsored Mark Armitage and I to go to the Hell Creek Formation in Montana, which is a very popular place for finding dinosaur bones, and we instead dug out a Triceratops brow horn. Now, it's just in crumbled pieces now, so we can't really, you know, put it together and show you a horn, and what we've done, of course, is have to work with it where you actually destroy portions of it, but you have to recognize that inside that rock-looking structure are Tissue, cells, and proteins. Not only that, there's blood. I saw, I, saw, I got blood in mine. And, Still there. And I, mine are human. <laughs> the DNA tested as human. And some of them are extremely large. They could grab that thing with one hand and crush its head. The, the whole thing about this, they have no idea of the scale of things. They're looking at these triceratopses and all that stuff. I'm going to tell you right now. Those things could easily have been parasites on the creatures I'm talking about, like Typhon in the, in the desert in Africa. That thing's 1,100 miles long. And if you haven't seen it, you ain't been looking. All right? These things here are a couple of hundred feet long, some of these biggest things they've ever found. Yeah, they're just walking around. They didn't never even know the damn thing was on them. I have no idea. All right, listen to this carefully. In 2015, they started to free up about this because Derek Briggs at Yale and his associates said the same thing. They came out with their paper, really 2016. I had done this research much earlier and proven all of the things and had my DNA tested and CAT scan and everything. But 2015, they started to open up and say, yeah, it's all over the place from the Great Flood. Listen to this. Or uh, part of a dinosaur had been buried for millions and millions of years. You would not expect to still be able to see tissue, but are you saying that's what we're finding? That is absolutely what we're finding. In fact, in a nature communication paper in 2015, they referred to it as common. <laughs> yeah. You want to see the paper from Derek Briggs, who I had presented this to for five or six years before, or five years anyway. He, he signed off on the paper saying, yeah, there was a worldwide flood, salty waters, fast, one layer around the entire world. To me, that's a worldwide global flood, and all my soft tissue creatures were, and he said, all soft body creatures, all biota, was preserved in this one layer perfectly absolute perfect preservation and it's all flat on one side it's all flat on one side what does that tell you and they, they still say well we, but we have no idea about this and then they just slid that paper under the desk and nobody's ever heard that they endorsed this the only people that are able to talk are people that are outside the system if you're inside the system you start mentioning this kind of stuff you're done see this is the paper right here this is the guy I was trying to work with. Oh, I, try, I think I've tried most all of these people. I tried almost everybody. And wait till you hear the stories i got to tell you about Mary Schweitzer and this other guy, Armitage, who was working with the people that found that horn. Because he told me, Mark Armitage sent me something. I think he communicated to me, or I tried to communicate to him. Something happened there. And he said, don't bother me. Stay away from me. Basically, and it was not a, a very cordial, you know, please, I'm busy or anything like that. It was, don't bother me, stay, you know, stay away from me. That's how I took it. Maybe I'm wrong. Mark, if I'm wrong, let's engage, my brother. I have no problem with that whatsoever. I just want truth and reality. And I have so much truth and reality that it's mind-boggling. Now, 
This is the guy I presented to, Derek Briggs, on a Yale University. And he wouldn't take him. He wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't let me through the door, would never examine it. I sent them all the stuff. Oh, we've seen it. We've seen all your videos. We did this. We did that. No, they didn't. And I said, well, what else do you need? Well, we need CAT scan. We need DNA. Okay, no problem. Did it. Got him done. Still didn't. No, it's still. Then they put this paper out 2016. I had all this stuff done and to, to, in the mail to him long before that. So this is just nonsense. And here it is right here. Worldwide, in this one terminal layer, worldwide, the fossils are prever preserved. It still remains controversial. They don't know how it was done. But all of these soft-bodied creatures, soft-bodied, biota just means life, promoted by silica-rich floods. All right? Nobody's heard this. It's had 173 views. <laughs> Nobody shared it. And this is from six years ago. My stuff is at least getting a little bit out there, but it's getting to people that won't, they have no authority over to tell, to force the kids to say what they want them to say. He's still telling people, I, I don't know what he's telling them now. I'd love to hear and see what his course is about now. They at least do have some honest people down at Yale, the, um, Professor Shankar. I took his courses in uh, quantum physics. He comes out, the first thing he came out, and that is honest, and I like the guy for being honest, is that nobody understands quantum physics. Nobody. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Just say what I tell you to say, and, and you'll go back and spread your ignorance. And that's exactly what he said. Now, I'm sorry, he is the honest one. This guy... As far as I'm considered, he fits the profile for a fraud. He would not allow my information in there, first of all, which means suppression of valid information. Secondly, takes credit for soft-bodied endocardial style. Look at endocardial style preservation. No, it's not. It's mud fossils. This is the guy that is a problem. And he should, it, it, yeah, should be ashamed. Absolutely ashamed. Because he, I didn't just send it to him. I sent it to everybody down there. All, they all knew what I was doing. As far as I'm concerned, if they didn't, then they are to fall, not me. All right, I'm just going to go through this. And I've been saying, showing this over and over and over and over. And I will keep showing it over until it becomes allowed. Nobody's seeing this. This is the issue. I'm not being seen by anybody. The people that are seeing this are the people that have seen it a hundred times before. And now they're getting fed up and they're just going somewhere else too. Because it's not being allowed into the structural educational area. You, you know, don't, don't, don't listen to this guy. He's guy. The guy's crazy. No, I'm not. I have the evidence. They have no evidence and only reading books to you that they, somebody told them to read. So that's why I start to get a little annoyed as I go through this and try to explain it. But what, what can I say? I had three different samples done. This was in 2015. I had the results done back in 9 of 2015. All of those, you know, this was after, oh, five, six years of, of working on this, trying to understand these things. And I did understand them. I sent three samples. I didn't send them the full sample. So in other words, I took a, a well, remember I showed you the blood coming out of a rock, coming out of a scab somewhere, like out of this one, I think. But all I had to do was drill inside where the blood comes out, right? where the blood is. It's blood. It's now sort of coagulated and sort of reddish, dusty coming out. But anyway, I collected up a little bit of it from each sample, and I put it in styrene bags or whatever you call them. And I'm very careful. I did it, you know, mask and all that stuff. Very, very careful. And they came out raw blood. I mean, literally raw blood. And uh, I sent them off, and this was uh, this is who did it, Helix Biolabs. And um, they did the extraction from the samples, and then they had that sent off to, from, you know, they, I, I don't know, they did all kinds of stuff. You can read it here. I, I have it online. And um, I, this was the first one that was done in the world, to my knowledge, that was from ancient DNA um, for, um, well, certainly for ancient human DNA. And secondly, certainly for ancient giant human. <laughs> now, they, they did all this stuff, whatever this is. 
but they did all kinds of things to boil down to a point where they could see the sequences of the protein attachments. Okay, that's, that's basically DNA. And they're, they're a sequence of CTAGs, which are the little amino acids. And, um, and they came out right in the order of mitochondrial DNA. There's two types of DNA. There's nuclear DNA, there's mitochondrial DNA. The nuclear DNA is very, gets a lot of big differences. The mitochondrial DNA, right down the line, stays very, very similar to all of the people that have ever been born. The mitochondria is very similar. There is a few little changes to basically species of humans. Because there's different, you know, your different races are basically different species. So there's been some mitochondrial changes, but not like the nuclear. So we targeted the mitochondria so we could be sure. Was this human or not? Or what, what, what was it? Was it even alive? And absolutely, it came out excellent quality DNA from the 36 inch tip and the lung and they are I said are you 100% positive no question whatsoever zero question this was human zero 100% certainty and these were the these are the sequences CTAGs the amino acid links and that's basically programming that's a program I saw this, this is a program. You know, they look at all DNA, what does that do? Well, it's a program. But in order for this program to work, you have to have all of the other molecules and minerals and so forth that these things say to go use to make body parts. So I get a lot into bio biology and diseases. And a part of it, a lot of times they say, oh, is it genetic? Does the disease is genetic? I say, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily genetic, just because it can't assemble the right stuff. Maybe you don't have the right stuff in your body to be assembled. And I say, well, it's the same stuff. I say, yeah, but everybody doesn't have the same bacteria. And the bacteria in you create enzymes. Enzymes are the real powerhouse, powerhouse of chemistry. Enzymes can break down molecules one single molecule of one enzyme can wipe out hundreds of thousands of other molecules just like that. All it has to do is touch on it. It's called click chemistry now. Something is another something brand new. And what it is is these these enzymes are so exotic they like, like, look like something like this and every spot has a magnetic signature on it. When it finds what it wants to kill because it's programmed to have those magnetic regions, they're called uh, molecular moments. And as it comes by, it says, do you guys fit my st stuff? And there's a big glob of stuff over here trying to invade you. It says, oh boy, we're in trouble. That guy's got the same code. It comes up, it goes click. And as soon as it does that, the magnetism goes zip and breaks apart the codes inside the thing. And it's all, all gone, it's dead. Spontaneous combustion, literally. So what I'm getting at here is there's a, I am as deep into this as anybody has ever been. And this was long before Yale or any of them signed off on it. The Nature paper, the same was 2015. Well, I had it all done long before that. So I don't know whether they're trying to slide in under the radar here. Because you don't see, I haven't heard anybody reporting on this, 60 Minutes, none of those. They started to report on Mary Schweitzer. And that's how I first got in with Schweitzer and Arm Armitage. Because I got a hold of Mary Schweitzer, she wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> I said, I kept sending, you know, I said, I, I know what you got. I got the same thing. I, I, it's, and I was trying, trying, trying. She wouldn't co co correspond. So finally, I, I called down where she, the, the university she was at, and I got a hold of the next room from hers and I told the guy this it was important that I had to talk to her and she didn't like that. <laughs>
And she said, don't bother me again. I do my own research. I work with my own samples. I don't want to see your stuff. I don't want to touch your stuff. I want nothing to do with you. Basically, that's how I took it. And that's basically how it was. And now I'm just the same thing. Now, how do, people, how do these people work together? How is scientists, science ever done? I put all this stuff out. I said, look, take a look. Tell me what you think. Let's work together. You want to test it? Test it. Nope. I don't know whether it's a club and they, they're, they're, they're afraid to lose some of their authority or their power or their income. or I don't know what it is. But I can tell you what. If you're trying to make it a living in this realm, you better not speak. Because you become sidelined very quickly. That is just the nature of this game. Okay, my friends, this is going to be a trip. I got up this morning and David Meek, a friend, sent me this and said, Would you take a look at it? Here's what he said. Hey, greetings again. This is Dave, the guitar maker. The video I'm sharing from YouTube talks about the collagens found in millions of years old dinosaurs. This video also speaks briefly about the chemical process, how they dissolve away the calcium leaving, you know, the matrix underneath. You see, so you wonder if what would happen if you were to expose a mud fossil to this process, which I, I've done. That's the same thing they're doing, too. It's exactly the same. What would it reveal? Exact same thing they reveal. So but we're going to go through this. But I have a history with these people um, about this research from Mary Schweitzer long ago and then um, Mark Armitage. Um, I'm not welcome, <laughs> but I do have a history here. Okay, my friends, this has turned out to be a very, very strange video. I started out by saying, well, I'm just going to do the same thing I do every day and show my mud fossils and show the DNA reports and show the physiology of all the things I have here in front of me that you've seen over and over and over. But then I realized the crux of the matter is, is nobody understands the chemistry. And the reason they don't understand the chemistry is because they don't understand the human body. They don't understand how your body functions or my body functions. They have no idea. They know they eat a bunch of stuff and they poop every now and then and they urinate and then they just go about their business and sometimes they get sick, sometimes they're healthy. That's it. Case closed for them. I go a little deeper. <laughs> I want to know what transfers things in your body because right now I'm going to tell you right now I can absolutely guarantee you if you don't breathe for the next 20 minutes your body will die well, what does that mean well I don't have any oxygen well that's true why not well because I need the air to come into my lungs alright so that's fine but your blood is what carries it around. And what's blood made out of? Right there, my friends. Basically, transition metals. All of these, you see these plus two, three, four, five, six states, all of these different colors? Iron, two, two and three. Two is the deoxygenated blood in your vein. The three is the oxygenated blood. It has extra oxygen. One of those gets clipped off to be used to keep your body alive. All of these other ones carry all kinds of things through your body. Every single thing that you eat has to be broken down by chemistry. Chemistry has to break it down in your stomach, down into little bits and pieces, and then it becomes reassembled into your body. I mean, your, a carrot will not turn into your fingernail. It's not going to happen. The parts in that carrot get break down, and then they get put back together. Yes. Now you got a fingernail. That's the situation. And the only thing it does is bacteria. That's why bacteria literally is your health. And that's where it lives in a, uh, a layer of your, skin, of your tissue that coats everything. And it's called interstitium. Brand new layer they've just discovered in 2018. And, and it's called a fluid-filled highway that carries all your immune responses. And once it breaks through that layer, that's when you're in trouble. So that's the layer we, that I've been studying very clearly for oh, 10 years or more. And, um, and in my mud fossils, I can see it very clearly. 
and that's the reason they had never seen it in living tissue because once they get it in a lab it's all flattened out and squished and all the the pockets are flattened out and all the fluids are gone but but I can see them because of like Caesar's throat here you may not be able to see that but in the microscope you can you can see well you can see that's his neck right there that's the artery down here right there would have been his throat come right up through here and the structural part of his neck is there now you can dissolve away some of this stuff and which is what they did in a, a, an article I'm going to show you now. Where, um, but I had I have blood coming out of them. I've had it tested, DNA tested, CAT scan. I, all my stuff is done. That fingertip right there is three feet long, and it is DNA certified. Not only that, this is a fingernail. That's a little pad. This piece I broke off right around the edge of the fingernail, and it still has a finger prints on it. I know I've shown this many, many, many times. I know you've seen this over and over if you've been sticking with me. And this piece here, you can't use that. You know, it's got the fingerprints on it, but you can't use it to get the blood. You get the blood down inside um, past that grip skin. That's what they call grip skin. you got to get down in here, down where inside. And it's just saturated with blood. The blood runs right out of them. This one here, the little one here, it died with his fingers facing down this way, flat like this. That means all the blood runs down to the end of the tips. The arteries just blow out because there's no restriction to them. And squirts the blood out. That is all blood. All around here. Hold on. I don't know if you can see that or not. This light's not that good. But that's all blood at the bottom. The thing died with its finger facing down this way. Right, that's the fingernail part. There's a little bump right there that they all have. And then the blood runs right out the artery side. The vein side clamps off so they don't pop out. And the artery side is the red blood. And in this case, it looks like it may turn into garnets or something like that. But it depends on where it is in what chemistry surrounds it as to what it will turn into. So, that, blood is everywhere. I mean, it's just saturated. Everything. Look at this. This is, this is blood coming out of a rock. I think it might have been this one. You know, out of one of these cavities. They have cavities all over the bones. They're called bone foramen. And this where, where blood transfers from one bone to the next bone. And um, veins, arteries, nerves, and so forth. This is sort of a network going on. Now... That's just a blood scab, just like on you. When it came out of the ground, it did that, and then I moved that scab off right up here. That's what they call fibrin, which is a clotting fiber. It's like you have in you. It catches all the blood cells, and then it turns into a nice clean patch, and then your scab falls off. And uh, this is what happens when the scab's gone. That right there, you see this little black line right there? That's the vein. You see this one here? That's the artery. And that would have gone up to the next bone or wherever, somewhere. Some skin or I don't know. But these are the two holes right out there. So I I had all three in a row. Is it was on it, half on it, off it. And uh, all my other stuff is very, 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 very obvious. Now, here's what we're dealing with is the transition metals and all these different colors. That's why you see all these fancy looking colors in rocks is because of the transition metals that are in there that have locked in. And these are these are the most important thing really that you can imagine in your body. They are proteins and enzymes. And these are so sophisticated and complicated it allows for all of the processes of life this is like one of the most powerful programs you can imagine. And all it is, is a bunch of little magnetic particles. And these are amino acids. And they combine, there's 20 different ones, so they could, the program efficiency can be just phenomenal. And you see all the different colors? That's the same different colors I just showed you with the transition metals. And they come like this, and you end up having positive, negative, 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 positive, positive. This is the signature of this gigantic 
molecule, which is called a protein, an enzyme, a catalyst. And it is powerful. And they just automatically squirt out a, a bacteria. And bacteria is thousands of different types of bacteria in your body. So you have so many of these programs floating in your system. Now, the key is you have to have the bacteria to create the enzyme. These are assembled. That didn't just happen accidentally. And over and over and over and over and over the same thing. The bacteria there has its program. The bacteria's program makes that. So if your bacteria is not there, you're done. You don't get a program. And what does that program do? They're enzymes. All right? These are all these little particles, and they turn into that really exotic molecule, and then it has a, a, a chemical job to do in your body. It goes out and does it by attaching in your bloodstream. And it has all these different attachment states. So if it finds somebody that wants it more than the, it wants these, it needs these. So in other words, what happens is your body is using up some chemistry and it changes its states of, let's say, your muscle. And your muscle changes some of these because it's being used. And then some new stuff comes down and it says, hey, I got some three instead of now you're down to a one. You want the three? Oh, yeah, 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 give me the three. It takes the three, it dumps the one. And then it's, it revitalizes that tissue. This is a continuous process in your body. You are dying every second of the day. And in a few minutes, you're dead if you don't get this transfer done. It's just the way it works. You're continuously invading and substituting chemicals. It's called nucleophilic substitution. Now, when you die, they can come in because water is going to be flowing through all these membranes. It, it, and there's a certain process that creates the membranes. It's called feldspar. All right, here's, here, these are the um, glycoproteins. Forget about that. We don't need to see that. Uh, this is... Same thing, glycoproteins, transferrin, it's all about transition metal changes in the body. This is the feldspar. Okay, and here's the key. Everything you're looking at here, that's feldspar. That's feldspar. It's all feldspar. That's feldspar all over this lung. All my stuff has feldspar basically on the surface of it, almost all of it. Now, what is, what's feldspar? Well, it's alumino silicates. All 100% are alumino silicates. However, they also contain small amounts, sometimes large amounts, of calcium, potassium, or sodium. It depends on how invaded these, this feldspar is. The aluminum silicates is the key. Now, here's the thing. That's aluminum and silicon. They're right next to each other on a periodic table, and they just barely hinge between these two varieties here. All right, these are in the other metals category, and these are in the metalloids. But aluminum silicates, you see they're right next to each other. So they are bonding with a bunch of other stuff, calcium, potassium, sodium, that we're down in this area here, to create feldspars. And then, as an addition to that, because we're working with some metals here. It has ligands and pinchers that can pinch on to other molecules and drag them through your body. When you die, it just turns into feldspars. And it's primarily on the membranes, because it has something to do with collagen. Collagen is the key that creates that barrier. All my lungs, all the skin, you see that? The inside is all basalt. It's nothing like the outside. Completely, totally different. And all of them are like that. Same thing here. That bone is nothing like the inside of that bone. Inside's black. All right, the outside is brown, this brown looking color. That's feldspar. It's all feldspar. Now, now we're down into the lung. This is down into the alveoli where it's going to be red and bloody. It's still going to have is collagens, because collagen is the feldspar. Collagen turns into feldspar, and you got so much collagen in your body. Where is it? Hold on. 
Okay, my friends, I am just going to focus in here and there and make some claims. That one right there is Zeus attacking Typhon. You see his coiled viper legs? Well, that also is a Typhon. And if you read Apollodorus 1.6.3, it, it talks about it. And there, my friends, is Typhon with his red flaring eye and his throat, and he covers all of North Africa. We're going to come in and look at this close. I know it's getting a little fuzzy looking. Now, the reason I am showing you those is because at the very bottom there, I'm going to show you the layers of tissue that are on these creatures. And these these little tiny dinosaurs could have been walking around under they were like ticks, not even. All right, and just, just to give you the broad overlook, there he is, there's Typhon. That's North Africa. There's the fish underneath him that he was attacking with his venom. That's some kind of noxious stuff and it ate right into the fish. Now this is all across North Africa. The Eye of the Sahara is right down here. And all this stuff ran out over the top of the Eye of the Sahara, which I believe was Atlantis. So we got a lot of looking to do just right here. But this gives you an idea of how big this creature was. And you say, oh, Roger, that's no creature. Oh, you don't think so? How about this? Here's what he looks like when you outline his head. It's exactly what you see in the parades and so forth in China and all that flashy stuff coming down their sides and fluty and snaky looking. They're, oh, that's exactly it. And it's described exactly in that way, exactly in that way, in Apollodorus. And some guy sent me a picture of a bell with exactly that face on it and hanging from it a fish <laughs> on a chain, which is nothing more than this fish on the chain. You see that? You see the size of this thing? And it's exactly what it was. It was a bell. It's apparently it's feng shui. It was a bell with a dragon wrapped around the bell and a chain running down, locked through the fish. And the fish looks exactly like this, and the dragon looked exactly like that. Okay, so what did I say? I said it covered all of North Africa. His throat was cut. He was a dragon, and he had a flaring red eye, and he was attacking a fish. Well, can I support those statements? Absolutely, positively, without question, and for certain. So, where do I start? Well, let's start with the fish. Here's the fish. Here he goes. His tail comes out over here. Around here, these are the scales, and there's the fish. Here's his fin, was being attacked by a Z-Dragon, who was called Typhon. And this is coming out of his throat. Now, here is his red flaring eye. And here is his unkempt, feathered, flaring, hairy, and they say all that stuff about him. And there's this big nose and so forth coming right down the neck. All down that neck is that fluty stuff you see on the dragons. All of this stuff here is body fluids running off. The body fluids will drain from a body and you just create that pattern around them. If you ever saw a coroner's report on a body that was laying around for a couple of weeks, it's exactly like that, a couple of months, whatever. It just, it just, now, can I show the throat cut? I absolutely can. And was it written about? It absolutely was. So what is this? This is his throat. That's where he ate stuff. Gigantic animals, like little dinosaur cookies, stuff like that. This was his scales that protected his throat. That's the scales. And you can look at them, you can see them. This is very, 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 very obvious. And they were plated so he could articulate his neck around and bite people. And then all of this stuff, again, that's just all runoff. All that's runoff. So let's get down to where he really got hurt. Boom. Right there. And it said Zeus, who is right here, 
cut his throat with his great and mighty sword, which is his thunderbolts, apparently, because he cut his throat. And that throat is quite well cut. And I can tell you right now, it's still bleeding red blood from the gash. Now, water will run out of here. And here's what it created, this, in the middle of the desert. You see that? If you understand what blood does, it is the product of life. I just talked about the transition metals, I think. But this is what, blood is just saturated with transition metals. It's coming out here. This is the red blood. It's running out. But in the meantime, it's growing. Everything is, is eating what it's pr providing. All right? There's going to be some watery effluent coming out of here because as you cut through all of those organs, there's all kinds of blood vessels and his throat is in there. It's in these tubing, fluids go down in there and they have to run out somewhere and that's where they run out because it was gashed with something. I mean, if that's not apparent to you, I, 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 can't, I can't make you see what you don't want to see. But that is quite obvious where it was cut right there. And it is on that map. And here's his body. It goes all the way across. And here's where his flared tail is, way on the other side of the... Of the this is all his tail. Right to there. And here's some dragon scales way out here. And the same thing, runoff. We see the runoff. This is where the scales came down. And these were the scales, 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 scales. And this apparently is a lower altitude here than up here. So the, the fluids ran more down towards this direction and out. Like puddled up in here somewhere and just... And down at the very end is where his tail flared up. Right out at the very end, you see? That's not just accidental. That is from his his tail feathers. He had literally feathers on the end of his tail. You know, they're dragon feathers looking things, but they're still feathers, I believe. And I have found other ones that there's no question about that they are feathered. And these were hybrid creatures. This thing had coils wrapped all around. And they are coils. They go all the way over to here and all the way over to there. And that's what they... That's what it was written about them. And sure enough, true. And if you look at it close, if you go to anybody that is a tanner, that does tanning, and you showed them this pattern, they would tell you that that is some kind of leather. All right, that's just not, um, what do you call it, just sand dunes, no. This is some kind of leathery substance. Let's settle in for a second. You can see it's, it's uh, if you looked at, at, at leather under a microscope, it's exactly what you're going to see. No question, it's identical. So this was the skin of this creature coming off. You see it? I've looked at it in a microscope. I have stuff that is all leather stuff. Even my belt and everything I've looked at, it's the same stuff. Now, that skin eroded off of his flesh. And in Apollodorus, it says that his thighs were like humans. And then after that, the coils came down. This is muscle. This is muscle that has eroded. And the erosion is basically the skin and so forth over to here. And people are living in that because it's, it's more fertile. There's developments down in here I was seeing. I'm not sure where they are, but... But you can see this. This is this is leather. Ta talk to anybody that does any leather. Go get a piece of. If you have anything that's leather in your life, <laughs> you know something that's basically this is almost like tanned. 
The only thing it's not is, is, is rolled with big heavy rollers, which is what they do after they tan hides normally. They roll them flat. And, but that's what that is. And that's what that creature was, was Typhon. And here's the thighs of a human. That's what they said. He had the thighs of a human. I'm not kidding. It. So if you, if you think it's just silly, well, all I can say is uh, have a nice day. Oh, what the hell, I'm just going to lay it on here. Bang, bang, bang. This is the size of some hairs that are on earth. This is Crowley Lake. This is the size of some hairs that are in your head. All right, this is the size of, uh, let me find some good thing. Well, this is the size of a thumb or a finger that's three feet long, just a tip, tip, tip. And this is its fingerprints. I think I've shown you all of this. This right here is tendon enthesis. And you see those crystals inside there? There's a crystal ca cavern they're showing now. The same crystals that are in that cavern are these, and in a tendon ball, which you need a microscope to see in us. This is the new interstitium, the newfound organ. These are those little balls in here. You want to see what those balls look like? How small they get? I think I have them right here. You see that? That's how small these balls get. These little tiny balls, you see them? In our interstitium, which is is the fluid-filled highway and the flexible place in your body. All these little watery bags are held in place by a, 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 an anchor ball. That's these anchor balls right here. Now this shot here, showing here, this is shot a little closer. This is how, when you get right down into the mix of the mess, this is what it looks like. And then you get real, real down. You just, you're, you can't even see anything, basically. But this is what it starts out like. This is like this here. And those balls are the anchors. And here's what they look like on the rest of the earth. Here they are the Moki marbles out in Utah. That's skin. That was skin at one time. It all eroded away, just as that is skin. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Big. Very big. These creatures were just staggeringly large. Now, these, again, this is nothing more than that fabric that should have been anchored in the skin. So you can pull this way and pull that way and pull this way and pull, and you come back. This is the same thing. That is literally the skin. That's the guy's skin. And this fleshy part here is where those balls were embedded, right across here. And they are roding out because they're the heavy, dense anchors right here. This is nothing more than this right here. There's the white skin at the top. Here's the red fleshy stuff right in here. Here's the balls right in here, and they have eroded and fallen into the mud, which is what is, it happens when this erodes. It turns into mud. All right, you saw all of those balls all over the place here. Well, here's what they look like inside of a human when you're alive. Yes, <laughs> the little balls. The straps erode because they're, they're kind of cheap compared to the ball. The ball is tough. Then you have your tendon, these nice flat tendon straps. The balls, that's an injury. That should have been anchored in there not to come out. However, when they go into the mud fossil phase and they erode in the ocean, the ocean will, will remove the, the bone. And you'll end up with these balls just laying in the mud, just like I just showed you. All right, you see this? This, my friends, is an abrupt transition tendon Anthesis. This was where the tendon locked into a bone area up here. It would have started to lock into a bone. And then the very short section of tendon, and then it goes into the muscle. And this is the abrupt transition. Tendon is very, very tough compared to muscle or bone. So this particular section here has maintained itself in an upright position. And that is just one thickness of tissue and all the way across the top is literally where the the fleshy part would have been I believe and then every one of these is a layer of membrane you see how many membrane layers there is 
There's literally hundreds and hundreds of them. There's not just one, two, three, four, five, six. There's like ten right there. This this is a very, very heavy connective tissue area because you um, tendon has a real toughness to it. But then it's sort of as as the abrupt transitions go, it turns into muscle. So this can just do a little bit, but the muscles can really go. And this goes just a little bit enough to give a padding to the bone. And of course the bone has just eroded and the muscle erodes into mud. The bone erodes into whatever, sand or something. Okay, this is basically what I just showed you is this section from here to here. And that remember that one spot, that really white spot? That's it right there. And the, the bone where it attaches up here has eroded away because, you know, it's a, a lot weaker than this stuff is, the, this, this stuff is tough. This abrupt transition here says, all right, now it's time to work ourselves into muscle. This gives you this. That's it. Just a bump. Just a bump. And, this, and mostly it's... Just a just a taste of of movement, so that you don't rip this out of the out of the uh, bone. They still do rip out, but and I've had it happen to me twice on each shoulder. So you got to be careful of that. Don't put too much stress on it. Otherwise, you if you once you rip it out, trust me, she's a no fun. Now, this is the point I just showed you, that other big piece. Now, see all this red blood? Red blood feeds muscle. You see how this is pinky looking? This is just brown. You don't need much blood in, in the tendons, almost not at all. But if you can't see the exactness of this, you see this right here? Boom. It's broken off right here for the one. And you're going to see right here coming across, and then it'll be broken off right here. And a bazillion little tiny layers. Now, this, I, I think, has a lot of extra padding. I think this was like a shoulder or something. But the one coming out of the ocean there, I, it looks to me like it just had skin across the top. And that can happen. They, they, you know, let's look at it one more time. Where are we now? Okay, here's mine right here. Here's the one. Remember that white pad coming out, that white, right here. That's the major con connective tissue. And this is where it's sort of just like mine. The bone is up, was up here and it rolls away. And right here, all of those layers break. And there's very little blood in here. You don't see a whole lot of blood. Now somewhere in here, well, I can't make any good statements about that, but you can see it's, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of little tiny blocks and you know, like here, there is some blood right here. This is where you see blood. Anytime you see red, I mean, uh, green growth, this is starting to feed into some blood, and you can see it right on the end. There's some kind of blood feeding that area. So you got to start to learn to look for the, the chemistry, the, the different colors and stripes and variations, the anatomy. There's a lot to learn here. All right, I think I went off on a bit of a tangent, but I can't help myself. This is a typhon right here. And are you going to tell me a 200-foot-long dinosaur that he would even know it was here? This is 1,100 miles long from here. Well, let's see how long it is. I think it's 1,100. We're going to start right there at the tip of his nose. And we'll go over there. Yeah, 1,168 miles. Even if we just stopped at the end of his tail here, he got 1,000 miles. You know, but he's all fluted out way out to here. And that's a big, big, big guy. Now, you take a 200-foot long dinosaur, or whatever you want to call it, I would call it a parasite, it would never have any idea the thing was on him. You know what's the coolest video I've seen? Pink Floyd, I love them, Pink Floyd. They had one 1972 called Mud Men, and it shows exactly that, that people were living inside this dinosaur. And the dinosaur had no clue. 
And I'm telling you, a lot of the stuff, I think a lot of these, well, I know for a fact, to be honest with you, that a lot of the sea serpents were in the digestive system. They were parasites. They were, they were the nasty little bugs that live inside of the guts. And they had no way to continue to live in there, so they went into the ocean and started eating ships and things and people. All right, when I say I, I know for 100% sure that extremophiles were living inside of creatures' bodies back then, just like they are now, you could have these living in you right this minute, with it, and you probably do have most of them. Now, where they find them is in these toxic areas on Earth. But if you look at your toxic liver and your kidneys and your pancreas and all of that stuff, we have the same extremophiles living in us. These, a lot of these are from inside of us right now. Tardigrades and you know, extremophile bacteria, they're living in us, creating the chemistry that we need to break down the products that come into these acids and salty areas and all that. Because that's what it does. Bacteria creates enzymes. The enzymes break those products down. If, those, if we don't have these extremophiles living on, in us, we don't have that chemistry. We don't have that chemistry. Those products don't get broken down. They don't get broken down. You don't have the raw materials to rebuild into something that you, your body needs. Every single chemical that goes into your body, 100%, is attacked by some form of chemical reaction to try to break it into pieces. That's what it does. That's what your body does. That's what chemistry does. It breaks it down into pieces. Now, there's going to be other ones that go collecting up those pieces and assemble them into what they consider to be their DNA package, and it's called a ribosome, actually, which is just a part of the DNA, but it's a, a functioning series of programs. And that program says, I'll take this type of amino acid and add it to that, and one more of these over here, and one of these, and it builds up a protein and enzyme that is designed to do a specific job in your body. I know that sounds confusing, but it is not. It, these are bacteria, little jobbers, squirt out stuff. It's almost like poop. They're, like you put poop on plants, it makes it grow. These things put poop on something, it makes it break apart, or it may, it may make it grow. But whatever they're squirting out, that's what is the, the product. And every one of them squirts out a different thing. They call them enzymes. Call them anything you want. They create a lot of chemistry real quick. Very, very, very quick. They're very specialized. Extremely specialized. And the only things that do them are these extremophiles in these extreme chemical conditions. Everything else dies. So you only have a certain set of species that can live in those conditions. And they're extremophiles. You put them somewhere else where there's a lot of acid and they're supposed to be in a salty condition, but they're gone. You see this? This is an old map commissioned by, I think it was Mus Musa Musafa or something like that, a real top shot guy during this age, which was 1375. It's called the uh, Atlas Cat Catalan Abraham Kresk. Now look at this. This is North Africa over here, too. Right? All across North Africa, there he is, coming way over to here. And guess what? His throat is cut right here, because that's what happened. His throat got cut. His throat got cut. That's exactly what it says in Apollodorus, and you can see the cut on his throat. This map is exactly accurate. His tail flares at the end. Exactly accurate. And I believe this was Atlantis. They're showing all that fluted, fancy-looking stuff there. They were the big shots.